Welcome back to the Provisionist Perspective. On today's episode, we're going to look even deeper into the structural makeup of the SBC seminaries, specifically the uh, presidents and how they lean on the Calvinist, non-Calvinist spectrum, and also uh, some of the uh, inner workings of uh, the Calvinism debate with those at the top of SPC life. Uh, and where we're going to go with this is that we don't really, from what we've seen, what we've looked into here, we don't see that what goes on at the top of SPC life matches what's going on with everyone else actually living out uh, in their church lives and in their uh, seminary lives uh, in the SPC. And uh, so we're going to get into it. Let's do it. So again, welcome back to the Provisionist Perspective, uh, where we want you to be firmly persuaded of God's love and provision for every person on earth. And so that's why we're talking about this today. These issues that we see in the Southern Baptist Convention and specifically the seminaries, because we want seminarians, some of whom may be you or a friend or a loved one, to be firmly persuaded of God's love and provision as they're going out into ministry, whether it's pastoral ministry or missionaries or whatever. And that's why we're talking about this today. And we're going to crack into it here. Yeah. So it was one of those things where you see things a certain way. You get a little bit of pushback from those who are in the SPC and you wonder if you're the one taking crazy pills, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and so like, am I wrong? Am I just, am I, am I just off about this? Am I just, am I wrong? You, you guys let us know if you think that we're misunderstanding something. Uh, Cause we feel like we're taking crazy pills. Yeah. We, that's what it is, is we're looking into these things and we're, are we red pilled or we blue pilled? I don't know where we are with this. You let us know if we're, we're off here. Uh, this kind this started with you know we've been talking about the SPC and traditional traditionalism lately, uh, and this is kind of another step down that rabbit hole. And sp specifically, we're going to be looking at the presidents of the the SPC seminaries. I made this claim. Okay, <laughs> I made this claim. Uh, that I put, this, I put this out out there on the Facebooks, and I made this claim that the SBC, the top five SBC seminaries, that four of them are run by Calvinists. I got pushback from someone within the SBC, a published tenured professor, uh, who said I was incorrect about that. And I'm, really? Okay. So I went looking for it, and I got continued feedback from him. Turns out it's three of the six are Calvinists. Three of the six. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Well, we'll get into who it is, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, no, let's do that. Let, let's get into that. And, uh, well, okay. So what are the six SBC seminaries? What is it that we're talking When we say SBC seminaries, what are we talking about? Those who aren't just immediately uh, familiar with all of this need to look into what are the SBC seminaries? So here are the seminaries that comprise the SPC. So all of the churches in the SPC, all thousands of them, uh, contribute by being members of the SPC. They send a portion of their tithes to the organization. And one of the things that the convention does is fund these seminaries. And uh, one of them is the Gateway Seminary at the Southern Baptist Convention in Ontario, Ontario California. Uh, he, the president there is a non-Calvinist, Iorg, I believe is his name, Dr. Iorg, uh, non-Calvinist. Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary is one of them. Uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, so Iorg at Gateway, non-Calvinist. Southern who is the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary? It's Al Mohler, isn't it? Al Mohler. So we yeah. know uh, what Al Mohler's is. Now, of note is that Southern is the biggest. 
Yeah. The and for those of you that don't know, Al Mohler is Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> in case, in case you're tuning in and you just ha happen to not be uh, privy to that, he's very. He has very one of the biggest worldview podcasts in Christianity, right? Mm. The briefing. Yep. Yep. And is a Calvinist now. Also, well, let, let's get into the abstract principles later. So, Southern. Is the biggest theological seminary is run by a Calvinist. Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Yeah, that's it, from that's from a that's a stone's throw from where I grew up at in Wake Forest, North Carolina. The president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary is Daniel Aiken, who is a Calvinist. Let's see what he has to say on Calvinism. He this is an article where he is directly addressing the issue of Calvinism within the Southern Baptist Convention. The history of Southern Baptists includes those on one side of the theological spectrum who have flatly rejected three or more of Calvin's five points and those at the other who have what? Enthusiastically. And those at the other who have enthusiastically embraced all of them with many Baptists following somewhere in between. The reality is, is that SBC has included five-point Calvinists and modified Calvinists from the start. It should be stressed here that from a denominational standpoint, in this discussion, there is no right or wrong. Southern Baptists have always been diverse in many regards, and the theological realm is no exception. Neither the Southern Baptist Convention nor its seminaries endorse or promote a particular theological system or stand on areas not addressed in Baptist faith and message. The main thing that I get out of what Daniel Aiken is saying here is we will see this over and over again. From the top, there is immense pressure to not talk about Calvinism, to not make it an issue. And so right there, he's saying, go talk about it. We, we have always been diverse. It's not right or wrong. It's always going to be a part of the SBC. That's it. Now, as to the claim at the bottom of this, where he says, Neither the SBC nor its seminaries endorse or promote a particular theological system or stance. I hope one of the things that you will help us with as our audience is understanding how is that true? Yeah. How is it true that especially Southern and Southeastern do not promote a certain theological stance on that issue? And we'll, and we'll explain to you why specifically that is that these uh, two, is, is it is it just these two that have the abstract yes. as part of their statement of faith? So, yes. Yeah. But also the Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary pr president is a Calvinist. Hmm. So you have two uh, that have accepted the abstract principles and we'll, we'll get into why we think that. And then another... Uh, seminary president who is a Calvinist. So this is Daniel Aiken again. We should affirm the truth both of God's sovereignty and human free will. The abstract of principles is what we're talking about was the founding confession for the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It was penned by Basil Manley, a junior in 19, 15, 1859. Manley was a Calvinist and yet Article 4 on Providence reveals a healthy th theological balance in our Baptist forefather. Manley wrote, God from eternity decrees, permits, and or permits all things that come to pass and perpetually hold, upholds, directs, and governs all creatures and, and all events. Yet so not as in any wise to be, okay. Yet so as not in any wise to be author or approver of sin, nor to destroy the free will and responsibility of intelligent creatures. If this is mine. Drew, what does that sound like to you? Well, it sounds a lot like the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Um, I did notice this is this, what Danny Aiken probably means here is the word permits. Yes. So as long as you chuck the word permits in there, it's fine. And I, it, this article actually is not the one that I have the most issue with in uh, the abstract of principles. Uh, this does give it a little bit of a Calvinistic London Baptist Confession flavor. Uh, but I, in but my there, there's, opinion, there's something there that a non-Calvinist could hold on to. A non-Calvinist right. could grab two hands tightly on the word permits and go, okay, 
I can't. Right. <laughs> I can stay right here. It permits. Yeah. This yeah. is fine. Everything else around it is a storm of Calvinism, but this word permits. I can just. I can. Just, so that is there. I get that. That is there. I admit that. Mm -hmm. And it comes back down to things like uh, the platitudes that we all know and love, like God is in control. You know, uh, like, well, OK, God is in control. Sure. But what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean by God governs all creatures like in that he's the king and that he has the authority? Or are we talking about de determinism and compatibilism here? Right. Um, because we're also not because Calvinists also talk about God permitting things. Uh, so that's not although we would argue it's inconsistent, that's not uniquely um provisionist or traditionalist or free will theist language. So we, we're, we're mentioning two things. We're mentioning Southern, which is Al Mohler. Okay. Clearly Calvinist. We don't even need to, need to go into that. Then it's Daniel Aiken, who is also, a, 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 I, from my, what I understand, a modified Calvinist where he actually does believe in um, a universal type of atonement. Is that yeah, right? He just, he's a four point Calvinist. That's all that means. Okay, he's so a, he's a four point. He's a, he's a compatibilist, uh, but who forms the four points instead of the five. So, yeah. And go ahead, and so we're talking about these two uh, abstract of principles affirming seminaries. What is the article of the abstract of principles that you have a problem with, Drew? Great question, and I want to bring this up so you guys can see this. So, what is uh, it? Why is it that we're saying? that Southern and Southeastern are particularly Calvinist organizations. Why is it we're saying that? And, and it's because of this single article in the abstract of principles. And, and guys, we really need you to help us out with this here because we feel like we're taking crazy pills. <laughs> so it is, so this is what we just read was article four on Providence. God from eternity decrees or permits all things that come to pass, yada, yada, we just read it. Uh, now, dear provisionists and traditionalists out there, you tell me whether or not if you were looking for a job at Southeastern or Southern and you wanted to become a lecturer and you wanted to, you know, teach or whatever. And obviously you're going to teach from your own perspective, tradition, traditionalism or provisionism. This says uh, election is God's choice. Excuse me. God's eternal choice. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it. Of some person unto everlasting life, not because of foreseen merit in them, but of his mere mercy in Christ, in consequence of which choice they are called, justified, and glorified. Now, I want to say, Eric, I, I mean, sure, I guess, like, you know, we would say that God has an eternal choice of those who believe unto everlasting life, uh, not because of foreseen merit in them, but then this makes me think like, well, this is excluding any kind of uh, foresight, faith, election, which some Southern Baptists do hold to. Um, and then, so there's that, that's one, but I guess you can do some gymnastics on that one to kind of get around to it. But this is the one of a couple of the ones. So regeneration, uh, article eight, regeneration is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit who quickeneth the dead and trespasses and sins, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the word of God and renewing their whole nature so that they love and practice holiness. It is a work of God's free and special grace alone. And for, I mean, this is a struggle, Eric, because we're, we're woke to this, but like it is a work of God's free and special grace alone is uh, what did I call it? Uh, reformed code language on Twitter <laughs> for uh, irresistible grace and unconditional election. Uh, but th that's, that's not really the, I mean, it's this enlightening. So the Holy spirit, this is regeneration. This enlightens their minds to spiritually and savingly understand the word of God. So in order to savingly understand the word of God, you have to be regenerated. And R.C. Sproul, you know, who's a Presbyterian Calvinist, has gone on record that the main thing about a ref reform theology is that regeneration precedes faith. You have to be given new life so that you can believe. Um, and I don't know how any provisionist or traditionalist could uh, affirm this. And then here's this, the article on faith. 
Faith. Saving faith is the belief on God's authority of what Soever is revealed in his word concerning Christ, accepting and resting upon him alone for justification and, and eternal life, it is wrought in the heart by the Holy Spirit and is accompanied by all other saving graces and leads to a life of holiness. Now, Eric, I get that for the providence section and the faith section, you could do a little bit of gymnastics and be, and say that it's wrought, but that it's, you know, it's resistible, you know, that mm. God works faith in you. I, I suppose you could say that. But this is the the providence and faith are very Calvinistically worded <laughs> for those of us that are kind of woke to this terminology. But es especially the regeneration, that's regeneration precedes faith. I don't know how anyone, like whether it was me or you or Brother Layton or whomever else, would be able to sign off on this. And this is a required document for all faculty to sign at Southeastern and at Southern, yep. but it gets more complicated than that. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to talk about what we found with regards to our so, rabbit hole that we went down? Southeastern. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. So then what happened was Southern, the actually after abstract of principles is the founding document of Southern, the biggest Theological Seminary. It was adopted in 1992 by Paige Patterson for Southeastern. They brought it over from Southern and he made it required at Southeastern. In 1992, during the entire uh, conservative liberal fight, when they were fighting over inerrancy, Paige yeah. Patterson said, oh, I know how to kick the in, the in those who deny uh, inerrancy out. The, to be able to keep professors who deny inerrancy out of this organization, out of this seminary, I'm going to require the AOP. Right. Now, great, but now you just made it so that no non-Calvinist can sign this document and you're going to have reformed presidents and reformed professors all up and down your organization. Yeah. And, and, one thing that I was uh, thinking about as we were going into this is that the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 actually solved this problem of inerrancy by changing their article on the Word of God to be more specific yes. with regards to its authoritativeness and without flaw and stuff. And so that change, if it was, and we assume that it was, uh, Paige Patterson, who was a very prominent figure in the traditionalist soteri soteriology, he's a non-Calvinist. A uh, very loud voice in that movement. Um, uh, in the conservative resurgence, as Eric has said, was trying to get the liberals out. <laughs> and um, but the change in the BFM 2000 made the made the AOP unnecessary. Like and in, in, in that fight, yep, right. And so then my question is, geez, Louise, Eric. I mean, it's 2021. 21 years later. Why do they still need the AOP? Because Why once not? you once you institute something like that, how can you take it away? You just do. <laughs> you you, just you'll do. Be, you, there's there's it's another layer of complication there that that it, it makes it hard, impossible to make these changes. And and this is why for me and uh, you, I have kind of a dog in this fight because I actually was considering going to Southeastern at one point. Um, and I was very aware that leaned heavily Calvinistic. Uh, it churns out uh, reformed and Calvinist uh, missionaries and pastors all the time. So I was thinking about going there and I was counseled not to go and to go to Southwestern, which is in Texas. This seminary is 30 minutes from my house <laughs> you know, and so when Danny Aiken says we don't promote one or over over the other and they adhere to and require their faculty to sign the AOP, that rings a little bit hollow for me, especially when I see uh, people coming out left and right that are reformed. And I've heard more anecdotal evidence that in these seminaries like Southern and Southeastern, if you you know, speak about traditionalism or, you know, what's now known as provisionism. And you say, oh, I don't know about this unconditional election and salvation. Or what about this? They just will shut you down. Um, it's not it's not something that's seriously considered. 
And I want to uh, get, I want to get more into this and, and get down more onto the ground level with exactly what are the, who are the professors and, you know, maybe even, yeah, maybe even what, what are their, uh, what are their syllabuses look like and things like that. Uh, now, so we, okay, so we have two of the top are uh, require the AOP, which is a, a Calvinist doctrine. I understand Paige Patterson signed it. It was for a totally different purpose, and he let the Calvinists in the back door, and, that, and that's the way that organization is now. Now, at Midwestern, uh, the uh, Jason K. Allen um, is the president at Midwestern Theological, Baptist Theological Seminary, and he is absolutely also a Calvinist. Uh, are we going to talk about this article? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, this is another, you know, crazy making, uh, uh, rabbit hole that I want to rat rant about, but we, you know, let's not, uh, go fully into Aww. it. I know, I know, but l let's, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's pull it up here. My temptation is I want to go through this entire thing and show all the problems with it. But what I will do in lieu of doing that, and maybe we can do another a whole episode on this, on this one. This is an episode worthy article, let me tell you. But basically what happens here is, and you can look up this, this article. He is getting, a, I, this is the big picture here, okay? This is, this is the uh, take a step back struggle uh, going on in the SPC. So Jason K. Allen is getting up and he is going to go preach. And it seems to me that he is not at his home church, that he's preaching at another church. Uh, and he, before he gets up there, he is asked, <laughs> are you a Calvinist? So you can get up there. Are you a Calvinist? Now, it's interesting that he says that question is not an uncommon one. Okay. So this is something that people are people concerned, are concerned about. about. Yeah. People are concerned about this. Is this is there is this guest speaker a Calvinist coming in? And he answered, and he listen to his answer. To be honest, sir, I have no idea what you mean by that question. Uh, You're a Calvinist. You're a Calvinist. Only a Calvinist would answer that question that way. Um, any non-Calvinist would be like, I know what that means, and no. So how is that? I mean, forgive me for not being charitable or whatever here, but like, how is that just not true? Like you're not exactly. speaking the truth when you say, I have no idea what you mean by that question. What he means by that is there are lots of different types of Calvinists. That's what he means by that. That's what so he what, so, the, so what we should be hearing here is, well, I, I, I don't know what you mean by that question. You tell me what you mean by that question. <laughs> right. Just so answer the question however the heck you want it. Don't give me this. Right. I don't know what you mean. Crap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, now listen to his answer. I'd be happy to discuss as much as you want after service, but know that I believe in preaching the gospel to be to all people, and that anyone who repents of their sins and embraces Christ as Lord and Savior can be saved. R listen to that so again. Triggering. <laughs> anyone who repents can be saved. A Calvinist could fully affirm that. We all know what that means. We all understand what's going on here. And then at the very end, so he goes on to talk about labels and we shouldn't talk about labels and, you know, th this whole thing, you know, we need to be biblical, fortright and wise. We need to do all this. Theological conversation is most always good, but it can be improved when it takes place on higher ground. So what if you, mean? so if you're, but if you're just, you know, Drew, if you are stuck in the minutia of whether or not someone is a Calvinist and what exactly they believe, you're just on lower ground and it needs to take place on a higher ground where we talk about what do labels mean anyway? <laughs> what, That's depends what this on what is, is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and now, now here's what's so interesting to conceal one's theological convictions is at once disingenuous and cowardly. Sir, I'm an outsider. I don't know you, but this is exactly what you have done. You have not been clear. You have hit, you have worked very hard to hide what it is you believe because you feel like you need to, because you run a seminary. So and this, this is what's going on here. 
And um, you missed the key, you missed the key point. Scroll okay. back up to to where he gives the answer. I'm not sure if you were planning on going over this, but where's what, his what answer? answer? The the I don't know what you mean by that. Oh sure. So he says uh, here. Uh, I don't know, I have no idea what you mean by that question. And then he says uh, the guy smiles and responds. I have no idea what I meant by that question either. So he's so. Jason has given him this Calvinistic, this reformed code language trademark um, response <laughs> that's anyone who repents can be saved. And then he smiles and he's relieved and he's like, you know, I don't know what I meant by that either, but you sound like a, you know, that sounds good to me because he doesn't, he's not woke to this uh, a theological normie being. Uh, precise with your words in such a way that sounds like what normal Christians believe, <laughs> right? <laughs> but right. it's not. So we've got three of the two of the top ones, and then another one, another Baptist theological seminary that is clearly run by Calvinists. I will stipulate that the other three, Gateway, New Orleans, and Southwestern, are not run by Calvinists. So you have three that are not run by Calvinists. Now I have to speculate because no three of those men will come out and say, I'm not a Calvinist. And here's why. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I have looking into the churches they have run and the things they have published. I'm, I'm pretty confident. And I've, I have uh, a source that has confirmed this, someone who's in the SBC. Uh, familiar with these matters that has confirmed that these three other guys are not Calvinists. So, but what is the other, what are the other pressures that are going on here then? So it should be, should be even, right? We've got three that aren't three that are. So, so then what's going on here? Where, wh why are this, is this still not balanced? And, and here's what I think it is. Cause that's the question, right? It's uh, okay. So what if certain presidents are Calvinists? are people who are going to these seminaries getting a balanced education from something like, and you guys have heard us talk about it, traditionalism and Calvinism both. Let's present both perspectives, get them out there, and you can decide for yourself. That's ultimately what we're asking for here. We're not asking for people to like lose their jobs or be fired or whatever yeah. else. Like we need to get all the Calvinists out of here. We're just right. asking for a little bit of balance. In the same way that we want balance on the interwebs, and that's why we're doing this, we would love to see balance among these seminaries. And that's the thing, right? Because as of 2007, and this was reaffirmed again in 2013, recent graduates of SPC seminaries are three times more likely to be Calvinists. Okay. Bananas. <laughs> so the percentage of five point Calvinists among SPC pastors, 10% recent graduates are three times the size of the representative population of the churches who are funding their education. Wow. That's the that's the issue. And if this is it's very telling that this research hasn't been done again. And mm. I think I know why. Mm. I think I understand what is going on here and why this hasn't been done again. There was a panel discussion that I found on this where several of the SBC, uh, people high up in SBC life, including the dean of the College of Theology at Southern, who is a Calvinist, uh, 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 who is a known Calvinist. He has um, to be because he has to from the abstract of principles. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, he, they were at this panel discussion. And the entire point of this, th this discussion was the SBC uh, should not be divided by Calvinism, that Calvinism should not divide the SBC. And uh, so panelists said, when a church has an opening for pastor at both sides of the issue, pastoral candidates and pastoral church committees must be honest in stating their beliefs and desires. A small minority of Calvinist page said, failed to be honest and then tried to push Calvinism on the church. Yeah, so Jason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're saying, oh, we shouldn't l let this happen. And then Lemke, non-Calvinist, right? Yeah, yeah. He Lem wrote a uh, he wrote a chapter in the uh, "Anyone Can Be Saved" uh, essays. On, well, it was an essay 
uh, expounding upon the traditionalist statement. So he's, okay, he's right. in my tribe. Steve Lemke, yeah. So he there, there is clearly a resurgence of, of, of Calvinism within the convention among seminary students, whether that be at New Orleans, and New Orleans is run by a non-Calvinist. This is that's the most non-Calvinist leaning seminary, whether it be New Orleans or Southern. So so this is known. Okay, we're not saying any, he contrasted the yeah, two. Yeah. We're not making this up. Like he said this, that th there is a a pattern here, and uh, students he said are coming to seminary with pre-commitment towards Calvinism, large because of non-SBC speakers like John Piper and others. Okay, so when you go. Two, uh, when you get into this, what you see is that each seminary professor, Calvinist or non-Calvinist, is committed to not talking about this. This is not going to be a central issue. Even Adam Greenway at Southwestern said, I'm not going to make this an issue. We're not going to go there. And then it's one thing not to make an issue, an issue, and it's one thing not to make it like central in the sense that we can unite in fellowship over this. It's another thing to just, we're, we don't talk about it. We don't right? talk about it. Don't talk about it. And uh, so they have panel discussions about how- pastors, How they're not going to talk about it. How they're not going to talk about it. <laughs> how, so watch, watch. This is Dr. York, the Dean of Theology at Southern. Uh, and he is, says this. York said he is committed to not letting this be an issue that divides us. The Great Commission is the commission that Christ gave to all of us, and we've got to be committed to working together to get gospel ends, gospel to the ends of the earth. So this isn't something that anyone is going to make an issue of. Our main focus as SBC pastors and presidents is the spreading of the gospel, and we're not going to do this. That sounds great, but... When three times that's, and I think that is a generous, generous number. Meaning it's like conservative, like as far as the, the number. It's a conservative. Oh, because, this is, because this is back in 2006 or seven. It's 2007. And, and if you look at the, if you read the article, if you read the questions that were asked, that number comes from only the graduates who would affirm five point Calvinism. If you hmm. get into the graduates that would affirm uh, sovereign election or the graduate center from forefront Calvinism, the number gets 50, 60%. So it gets higher and higher. Uh, so you have this going on here where no one's going to talk about it. The graduates, here's the other key principle here. As Lemke said, seminary students, theologically minded people go before they ever set foot into a seminary classroom Get their answers from where? The internet. And what resources are ubiquitous on that internet? Uh, Calvinistic resources. Let's see. Desiring God, the Gospel Coalition, Together for the Gospel, Got Questions, Nine Marks, Christianity.com. So then Should you I have so then you have that situation where theologically minded people are getting Calvinism from the internet. They go to a seminary school. If they go to Southern or Southeastern, they get fully indoctrinated into the Calvinism. If they go anywhere else, they get, we're not going to talk about it. And so then they just come out Calvinists. And you now, I read where in that panel discussion, uh, Dr. York is praised that his congregation doesn't even know he's a Calvinist. Okay. And that's like that lay guy, right? Like he's like, oh, well, I don't even know what I mean by that, but it sounds good to me. You know, you said anyone can be saved. Is is that what he said? It's not what he said. And right. You don't make this an issue so much. And it, it looks like York runs a uh, very successful church uh, there in Kentucky. Uh, it was called, it's called Buck Run Baptist Church. Fantastic name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they 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 uh, have this huge 100 acre uh, complex, and he it looks like he teaches he preaches whosoever will type theology, and and it looks from what I could tell, and, and he even says I don't mention it, and my congress don't know I'm a, con a Calvinist, so we're not going to talk about it. Pastors should be upfront with search committees that they are Calvinists. But then the dean of the school of theology, his parishioners don't know he's a Calvinist. Help me with this. I don't. I don't understand how this isn't all set up 
for the exact division that they say they don't want, but mm-hmm. not from the top. That that pressure to not talk about it from the top will, will continue, but from the bottom up. It's coming from the seminary graduates who come in and uh, want to reform churches and get them back to sound doctrine. And they, they answer things like what Jason said, you know, well, I don't know what you mean by that. Or, and we can get into this down this rabbit hole at a later stage, but uh, PJ, I don't know how to say his last name, Tibayan writes an article called preached, uh, preach the gospel, not Calvinism or preach the Bible, not Calvinism mm. in which someone asks him, are you a Calvinist? And he says, well, what do you mean by that? And then he, and then the guy gives some kind of crazy, you know, out there, you know, hyper Calvinist. You don't evangelize. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And he says, no, I'm not a Calvinist. And then, and then he goes on to explain in the rest of it, how he successfully reformed the congregation over years and brought them to the doctrines of grace and stuff. And I'm like, this is, this is published on nine marks, a, a, a phenomenal, like, you know, if you want to look to a resource and you're thinking, man, how do I get, I want, I want to produce healthy churches. You know, we talked about seven signs that your pastor's a narcissist. You know, we want, we want healthy churches, not these other churches that we have experiences with. So nine marks, nine marks of the healthy church. That sounds fantastic. Let me go to these resources. It's, you know, they're reformed theology and they think that your church is unhealthy. If you don't have reformed, uh, you know, a congregation or whatever. So then this is published on their website as him saying like who, who in the Christian community came and said, uh, brother PJ, I think that maybe that was a little bit dishonest. <laughs> I don't know about you. Like, what? so it, it sounds great to say, we're not going to divide on, on, on this issue. And at, from the standpoint of, Hey, we're not going to endlessly bicker about this and toss people out of the SBC or the kingdom because of this theological view. That sounds great. Let's, I agree. Let's not do that. But this, let's not talk about it. This pressure, this immense pressure not to talk about it at the top of SBC life sounds great until you ask this question. What are you doing though with churches in your area who split over this? Because it's happening all the time. Do you rebuke those pastors? Do, do what, what is there anything that you're doing that makes it so the pastors who are going in to search committees and not being truthful and then reforming the church later, that there's some sort of consequence for them? If we're not talking about Calvinism, then we're not talking about how Calvinists are doing these things and it's happening all the time. That doesn't mean that you're avoiding the division. The division is there, just nobody's talking about it. And this is, and and that's ultimately, you know, Layton has said this multiple times on his broadcast about uh, his wife who works in uh, therapy, if I'm not mistaken, and how families, as a Christian family, you know, an SBC family, that's the tradition that I come from. If you don't talk about your differences openly, they become problems. Right. And so that's that's ultimately all we're talking about all we're asking is whether it's seminaries or in your church or whatever, you're just upfront and honest about uh, what you believe and why, and let's have a conversation and present it to the congregants and say, well, you decide, you know, which one do you think fits better reform theology or provisionistic theology or, or whatever. Um, That's the issue. Yeah. And, and where I think the main questions here are, how can the abstracts of principles exist as a document when you say, when Daniel Aiken says that the SBC or and their seminaries don't take a stand on this? I don't understand that at all. The abstract of principles is a particular Calvinistic document that there are a few handholds that non-Calvinists could hang on to, but it's in a sea of quoting the LBCF. Then you have the, we're not going to talk about it thing. Uh, and then you have the evidence that most graduates a way higher rate than the churches that fund their education are coming out as Calvinists. And that doesn't that's, seem to be a balance here. And that's what we're asking about. Are we taking crazy pills? 
Is this you let us know. As you, you let us know. Let us know in the comments. You find us on the socials. Let us know. Are we crazy in seeing an imbalance here? So thanks again for tuning in today. That's our episode of The Provisionist Perspective. And we just really want balance. That's what this is about. We're not trying to run people out and, you know, say that this person shouldn't be teaching in this institution or whatever. We just want the seminarians to be able to go in to see reform theology and provisionistic soteriology, traditionalist uh, soteriology, and to be able to decide for themselves. And obviously we're biased. <laughs> we want them, we want you, your loved ones to be going into ministry and doing the kingdom's work uh, firmly persuaded of God's love and provision for every person, because in our minds, that's the only way to do it. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, give us a like, uh, comment below. Uh, if you're enjoying our content, we do have a patron page. Uh, you can have special access to our Discord servers where we do memes. We kind of have sounding boards and stuff to like, hey, will this meme work? You know, what about this episode idea and stuff? And so it's a good way to stay in touch with us a little bit more directly um, and pitch us ideas and give us feedback. And, and we appreciate the community there that's developing uh, and we appreciate all of your support. So thanks. And we'll see you next time on The Provisionist Perspective. See you then.